So I will have them introduce themselves. Well, first of all, I hope you enjoyed the comedy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Gita Palopoli. I'm one of the co-writer, producers, and directors of Beneath Harvest Sky. And I am Gita's husband, uh, Aaron Gaudet, the other co-writer, producer, director. It is great having a room of people that respect acting. We yeah. love and respect actors. Yeah. Let's Thanks give him another hand, yeah. Thank you. So a, a main reason or a part of a reason we do the independent film screenings is to encourage um, actors and people to create their own work. So a lot of that conversation will be around their process of creating this film. Um, and it always starts with story and scripts. That's the foundation. So how did the story come about? And then how did the story eventually become the script? Yeah. The good thing is you don't need money to make a movie like this. We didn't, we didn't have any. We'll get there. Oh, yeah. we'll get there. Um, we were actually, I'm from Maine, but I'm from about four hours south of where the movie takes place. And I had never gone that far up north in Maine uh, because it is just potato farms. and. Uh, but we were living in New York City and thinking about, we had just finished a documentary and self-distributed it and we were thinking about our next project and I just stumbled across these photos of a potato harvest in northern Maine and thought they were really beautiful and showed them to Gita and we were going to Maine uh, to where my family is for Thanksgiving and we said, oh, we'll just take a ride up there and check out that area. We had wanted to do some sort of a coming of age film and we're looking for a backdrop. Yeah, we wanted to do a coming-of-age film, and we didn't quite know what, but we were just really captivated by that area. So um, we come from documentary film, um, and before that, local television news. So we really wanted to just go up there and just start talking to people and getting a sense of what was special about Van Buren and being a border town. It felt like there was a lot to offer that the rest of the country hadn't seen before. And um, so we moved from, basically it, we made a decision after we visited for a few hours and said, um, let's move to back to Maine and spend a year and a half writing and researching. Yeah, six weeks after that, we moved from New York to Maine in the dead of winter and went, went all in. Good thing it's hard to find apartments in New York. Yeah. <laughs> We're like, okay, we gotta yeah. let this go. And was it full-time kind of writing, research, that kind of a thing? Were you living with family, or were you like all up there on your no, own? No, we, we rented a place. We didn't move to Van Buren, Maine. That would have been crazy. <laughs> but we moved to Maine, and uh, we would drive up there and spend you know a week up there at a time and just research and write and talk with everybody up there and a lot of kids and just... You know, what was it really like living up there, you know? And everything in the script is from stories told to us from people. And yeah. so hopefully it's a, you know, you, you could live a life like that in Van Buren. About 90% of what actually is in the script and in, on screen is actually what happened in, from the stories that we collected from people in the area, including the truck drugs and everything like that, the MDEA, the Main Drug Enforcement Agency, worked with us very closely through the entire drug storyline so we could be as authentic as possible. Uh, the only difference is the farmers that helped make that equipment, because we used farmers because we didn't have a lot of crew <laughs> in our budget, um, they actually were saying that they could yeah, make Yeah, the farmer that, like, built that <laughs> fuel tank. Uh, you know, he saw the MDEA photos and he built that for us, but he was like, oh, I see what the guy did wrong here. I, you know, if I would have done it, he wouldn't have gotten caught. So, yeah. Hmm, interesting. Um, <laughs> so then, as you're doing your research, what, is there certain stories that just stuck out? You're like, okay, this has to be in the script versus, or did it kind of stumble yeah. across things? How did you so, kind of decide? When somebody decide? tells you about a moose safari, you say, okay, that's, in. that's going in, yeah. I think for us it was about, um, you know, we came from, you know, local television news and then a, the documentary being in Maine. And so anything that kind of surprised us or seemed that, you know, like the vodka tampon scene, for example, we had never heard of that. And we were like, does that really happen? So then we started talking to the police chiefs in the area and they were like, this is a huge problem. And we were like, all right, it's going in this, in this movie. But also it was just like, you know, talking to these kids and seeing how a lot of them you know, there, there's really smart kids up there. A lot of them just, you know, there's not a lot of opportunity. So it was very clear that a lot of kids leave right after high school and try to get at least to southern Maine, to bigger cities, or Boston, or somewhere else, and, you know, where there's just more opportunity. So, I mean, that was the nucleus of it, is just, you know, these kids want to get out, and it's a great backdrop for these 
two best friends and there's this thing that, you know, there are ways to survive up there that aren't always on the up and up. So to have that be a place where they can kind of pull each other in different directions, I think was. And growing up, one of our favorite movies was The Outsiders and those were kind of, kind of genre movies. And we really felt like, you know, present day, there weren't really a lot of films like that yeah. for outside of like, you know, whatever, like vampire movies and things like that. So we felt like, um, we wanted to tell a story that kind of in the marketplace wasn't actually out there, and that's where we kind of really started focusing. Um, you know, one thing when, during our interviews, you know, we talked to so many kids, and, you know, because Van Buren, it's a K through 12 school. Mm -hmm. So once you, the teachers kind of filtered you out, whether you're a good kid or a bad kid, if you're a bad kid, you're not getting resources to help you figure out college opportunities or, you or don't, anything like that. You don't get to go to another school for junior high or something and reinvent yourself. It's like they know you and they just sort of, oh, that's a bad kid all the way through. Um, how many drafts before you got to the final one? Kind of what was that process? Uh -huh. I mean, we definitely sort of rewrite a lot as we're writing, so we feel like when we get a first draft, it's probably more polished than some, but then I think what we shot with was like the 20th draft or something. I mean, we definitely go back and do a lot of rewriting, and then we also really wanted to collaborate with the actors, so we told them to not be precious with the words and that we always wanted to sort of go beyond the script to get that authenticity and to try to get those real moments. So even with the 20th draft, we kind of, as long as we were hitting the story beats, we didn't care if they had something and you know we were in the moment, let's go with that. Yeah, a lot of our actors came in um, in pre-production and, and instead of going through the script, because we just suspected they would already know the script by that time, that their job was to go and immerse themselves in the community. We set them up with real people that kind of match their character so they can know who we actually wrote around to create potato farming boot camp yeah. some of them were just really farming potatoes and emory cohen who's a method actor he um you know was casper throughout the entire movie he just would we'd drop him into town and in days he made all these friends and got into the drug trade very quickly and really wow. took to it so yeah, he found kids that were really doing that and then when we started production and we you know started going into town everybody was like oh i know Casper." Yeah. They're like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully he's still not up there hanging out. And <laughs> he's, no, at he's at Sundance now. Yeah. Um, so then how, talk about once you kind of had the draft, when did you like, okay, let's enter that precarious pre-production. Right. What well, was that for you guys? The beauty is we greenlit the movie ourselves, which yeah. if you can, if you can yeah. green light it yourselves, that's, that's the way to go. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we, um, you know, we didn't know the entire, like we came from documentary and, and first of all, that process of moving from documentary to narrative is such a grueling process of most people telling you, you won't be able to move from documentary to narrative. So they kind of think you're crazy when you're like, we wrote a script and they're like, yeah, sure, you wrote a script. So the idea for us was, um, if we believe in the story and feel like it's good enough, let's, the only thing that we can't do is get to actors that we want to work with. We can figure out everything else on a production. We can figure out what locations we want to do. We'll figure out the camera and how to afford that. And we'll figure out all these different aspects. But the only thing we couldn't get to is figuring out how to access actors. So um, we cold called um, Allison Jones' office. One, one of the reasons we were trying to study the casting process was figuring out who would be the right casting director for us, not just let's just find a bunch of indie casting directors and just send the script to them. Right. And we knew we needed yeah. these really strong young leads. And it was like, well, what do we love that, you know, has had that before? And we started looking at all of our, the stuff that we love the most. And, you know, we're looking at freaks and geeks and stuff like that, where she's finding these great young kids. Uh, and even though she's comedy, for a lot of stuff, she does a ton of comedy casting with Judd Apatow and Adam McKay. Um, we were like, but she has a unique eye. She somehow knows how to find these young talent and really develop them into something special. And she's also not someone that's just like working on the same list as everyone, but she's yeah. actually out there discovering new people and championing new people. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's like any of the stuff that she casts, whether it's The Office or anything, you're seeing these people where, you know, I go back and watch Undeclared and it's like, oh, there's Jenna Fisher in this little blip of a role and she's stuck with her and got her on the office or, you know, so it's like we would see stuff like that from her. It was just like, oh, like she's perfect, but you know, why would she 
cast our movie, but. Yeah. So then how did you convince Alison Jones to cast your movie? So we um, cold called her office from Maine, <laughs> and we, um, Ben had answered, and no, Peter had answered, and we were just like, we're a Maine, filmmakers making an indie movie and they were like oh <laughs> you know Allison does you know pretty big movies typically or television shows and we were like well you know would you just would you just do us a favor and put the script in front of her desk and if she likes it I'd love if she would contact us but if she doesn't no problem there's no yeah, if she starts to read it and she hates it that's fine yeah, yeah. And then was it like a week later, or like very Something shortly like that. after? But yeah. she called us mm -hmm. and she said, "Did you send this to me because of my connections to Maine?" And we said, <laughs> "No, we didn't know that you had connections to Maine." And she's like, "Oh, my yeah. sister lives in Maine, yeah. and her husband is from Northern Maine, where your movie takes place." Yeah. So we we're like, "Oh, perfect." Like, oh, she's like, "So I'm familiar with this, and I would I would love to work on this." So. Yeah. It was meant to be. Yeah. Wow. And then she came in, um, you know, it's kind of a crazy experience when someone like Allison comes to any area. But, um, you know, her team, Ben and Peter, came and did a Bangor main casting call and a Portland main casting call. But because we wanted that authenticity, our mantra going into this movie was um, real and authentic. That was like our whole MO for this project. And um, so she was like, if that's what you're going for, I need to be there and I'm going to come to Van Buren, Maine and cast. Um, in that area. So not only did she do the main roles, but she did all the extra casting and local casting and everything. So when she came, everybody from Aroostook County came out because they were like, this is my big opportunity to be right. in front of Allison I, Jones. I can be the next McLovin. Yeah. <laughs> so your casting director was the most famous person behind the scenes for you for a while there. Probably, yeah, yeah. Nice. yeah. Um, yeah. Then how do you, coming from the documentary film world, did, was your department heads, were your DPs all from that world too, or did you, how was kind of that structure? No, I mean, we definitely got department heads from, from other films that we saw, and as we reached out and stuff, from like the indie narrative world. Um, and then, you know, they were sort of, uh, underneath them were people with maybe like varying levels of experience, but we definitely got good department heads from like New York and LA. and. And then we really just, you know, we had such a tiny budget for this film, so we couldn't afford to have a big crew. And A, we didn't know where to ever house them and do all that stuff because we housed everybody at Catholic Retreat Center where, you know, there's there no luxuries in this project. So any actor that was coming on board had to know up front there were no luxuries that they were going to get. Cell phones don't work because yeah. it's connecting to like a Canadian cell tower and yeah. stuff. So, I mean, yeah. it was, we had to tell them going in, like, this is, yeah. you're staying in yeah. like a dormitory style place with yeah. you know Jesus everywhere <laughs> and you're all sharing dormitory style bathrooms and it was it was but everybody yeah. was up for it yeah it was like uh, you know we joked but it was like our Woodstock because that was definitely that very much of a feel for it but um you knew no one was there for the money they yeah. were there because they <laughs> liked the script and were passionate about yeah. the story exactly and I think um you know for some roles like we knew when we were going into production that we needed somebody who um, understood what a producer's role could be and really take over that full time while Aaron and I were uh, directing the movie. And uh, my sister, she um, worked in finance for a number of years for General Mills and then ended up working for the government for a number of years for the Peace Corps, literally managing, you know, I think like Cocoa Puffs and all these like huge lines for stuff. and. Um, we were like, well, if you can manage a serial line and you can work for the government doing all this stuff, like, I'm sure you can manage a film production set. Like, would you please quit your job and come to Van Buren and Maine with us and, and work? Because we trust you uh, to be able to pull that off. And we ended up, because of her help, being under budget and wrapped a day early. Wow. Yeah. So, so let's talk about that budget a little bit. Was it yeah. like, Kickstarter, any of that? Was it purely just out of you know credit cards and savings? No, we we never would ever do that because we come from. I was a financial analyst before as well, and I think I think what's important is knowing um, how much risk you're willing to take on, but also understanding the realistic opportunities that you're going to have in selling your film in the marketplace. And right now, there's it's you know you you might see these variety alerts about sales at Sundance. But if you really ask people at the end of the day what they're actually putting in their bank account, you'd be shocked. <laughs> um, and I think for us, it was really important that we, we are in that capacity very risk averse. If we're going to say, please give us some money, we want to make sure we can get that money back to whoever we 
um, in, who whenever entrusted us with it. So um, we had two people in Maine who really loved our documentary who donated to help us make that movie. They came on board to invest a, just a small amount of money into our movie. Uh, literally, not because they saw the script or read the script. I don't even think they ever read the script, but it was mo mostly because um, they wanted to invest in us as filmmakers. Our documentary was very heartwarming, and I think they just wanted to help us take that next step as artists, and, and we yeah. weren't asking for a lot of money. Yeah, and then the other part of it was just a part of our savings that we're like, okay, no matter what happens, if we would put this part of the money towards our savings, towards the film, we'll be okay. Yeah. And that's how we did it. Nice. That's lovely to hear. Um, let's talk a little bit about production end of things. So now you're getting into production. Um, like you said, you were one day short. How many days did you originally plan? 36, and we wrapped after 35, which that was a long, a long shoot with no money. But uh, Yeah, that's a really long shoot. That was shoot. the whole thing is, you know, we set out, we're like, okay, we're not writing one of those indie movies that's like three people in one location, and it's shot in 17 days. We're, we're going to do this full world and we're going to have, you know, there's a lot of characters to it. And, you know, the biggest thing for us was we want time for our actors. We really do want to explore beyond the script and we don't want them to feel rushed and we don't want to feel rushed. So it was all about how can we get the most time? And that was everything, you know, pay people, house them, and then how long can we have them there? And that was sort of like the the thought process, which was great because we weren't rushed and, you know, we, we never were, you know, struggling to make days and, you know, I think that was a, a, a good idea. Yeah, I think a lot of times people make the mistake of budgeting for exactly what they need and they think they can pull everything off in this small, tiny window and so much stuff happens in production that you never plan for, you never expect. And also, when you plan to the minutia detail of schedule, things go over or something's not working right in a scene and you need to give that time to the actor and time for you creatively to explore that. So even if it takes 45 extra minutes, Aaron would always tell our DP that it wasn't about like getting the lighting perfect. That wasn't going to be important to us. It was really about getting the performance perfect. Because he could always get it looking pretty good, you know, within a short period of time and then they spend just as much time like kind of tweaking it and getting it perfect and it was like when we get to that pretty good part like that's when we'll give their that time back to the actors because we want it to look rough around the edges like that's the world that's sort of like the movie we're making so actually works for us so let's just give that time to the actors and and that was was great you know he would get it to a point would say okay let's go with it then um take us behind the scenes a little bit um was there any shots were like okay for this shot to happen like the dogs had to start barking, barking for five minutes or the police was chasing like what we're kind of say the dogs. yeah that's <laughs> i mean there's a lot of sketchy places that we would uh, even when we were going up and writing we'd drive around and we found this place where we didn't really dare to go knock on the door uh because it was very sketchy and there were dogs barking and stuff and uh our locations manager, we, we found, uh, is one of the farmer's sons who had moved away, but he would come back for harvest, but he had a great last name. Everybody knew him, and uh, we became friends with him, so he came up, and we this would just... This is a terrible story, yeah, this by is a the terrible way. There's no story, happy it's, ending it's to this story. It's your fault for bringing up dogs, <laughs> yeah. but um, he, you know, we would take him to these places and say, okay, like, go <laughs> knock on the door, and this one guy was very scary, and uh, but allowed us to shoot there, and... and the day before, a couple of days before we were going to shoot there, he went there to say, you know... Oh, Allison Jones was with him. Yeah, yeah. Allison, Allison was visiting, was and, uh, <laughs> and you know, can, can we move the dogs for the day to be quiet? When he got there, this dog comes running up to him with porcupine quills all over his face, and this guy comes up behind him with a shotgun and grabs the dog drags him around the corner, and you just he hears a shotgun blast. And yeah. he comes back, and he's just traumatized yeah. like what I don't know what happened like you know but this guy was just like a, a nut <laughs> but, well, uh, I think it was because he could either take the dog to the vet but he had so many porcupine yeah. needles in his face that they he thought it was gonna be too expensive and so I think that's his uh, that's what that was his option I guess but it was like a traumatic experience yeah. for us. You brought up dogs, and it just <laughs> yeah. reminded us. I didn't of know. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but there were a lot of uh, 
Yeah, that's that's, that's a real. Story, but... That's like totally no, kind of yeah. like what life is like up there sometimes, where you're struggling to make ends meet or pay. Right now in Maine, like crazy snow, you're trying to pay heating oil. Like you know, they're thinking they're not going to take a dog to a vet to. Yeah. A better story is uh, <laughs> yeah, like, we would have farmers <laughs> yeah. do stuff. You know, it's like we have a lot of driving scenes in our movie, and we didn't have money to rent, you know, equipment to to do those driving scenes. And we went to these same farmers, and we we kind of showed them the normal the normal riggings. And he's like, "Yeah, I could I could do something." And he took old bleachers from the high school and some scrap metal, and he built this rig that could go on the front of any truck or on the back of any truck that had a plow rigging or a trailer hitch yeah. and all the driving scenes was our camera crew like on this platform rigging that the farmer built yeah. and uh we better, they would always yeah. do stuff like that and, the, and they you know our crew would be like yeah. this is better than that stuff because you can take it off any vehicle with a few guys and put it on the back or put it on anything it like a and, few minutes instead of like yeah. a longer drawn out process so then it sounds like not only did you guys make this film, but the community there um, made the film with you. Very much yeah, so, very yeah. And do you think you could have made this film without being there and them knowing you so well and you spending the time writing and hearing their stories yeah. and all no, that kind of stuff? No, never, yeah. yeah. I mean, we did not, we paid for one location in the whole shoot and it was on one of the days where we actually shot over the border in Canada. It was the seedy strip, strip club. We paid two hundred dollars to have the strip club for the night, but it came with two strippers. So we felt like that—that's a good investment. That was a good. That's that's know. that's a good yeah. deal, Canada. Yeah. I mean, so yeah. Um, so I want to spend some time because you guys have such, and we talked a little bit about this in the distribution panel, but I want to bring it up in case people missed it. Such a unique kind of story, and I want you to just kind of have a chance to share kind of once you got into post-production kind of what how did that process come about for you guys so um so we thought about just you know, when we learned um early on in the filmmaking process is you can't think about distribution right when you're finishing post you have to really think about it um you know way earlier than pre-production but by pre-production you should really know who your audience is what you're going to plan on doing how your budget is determined by what your distribution plans are going to be so all of that goes into what we are defining as a budget what we're defining as our schedule what we want to create on screen our goal was uh, aaron and i personally we wanted to make something that didn't look like a tiny budget indie we wanted to give people a chance who would never have a chance to come to van buren maine a time to just immerse themselves in this experience on film. Um, so we ended up trying to figure out how to pull this film off by going to a team from Harvard Business School. And we said to them, um, we had worked with them before on our documentary and that was a really successful experience. And uh, we said to them, we want to figure out how you can work with a distributor. That last film we did on our own and we self-distributed and that was a great experience for us. But, but it takes a lot of work. It was a year and a half where we suddenly yeah. weren't filmmakers, we were just business yeah. people distributing our movie. And we didn't want to have to repeat that again. Exactly, so um, we went to Harvard Business School and we said, let's figure out how it can be a win-win experience for a distributor, for investors, for us as filmmakers. And we set out our goals, but the big goal was, what do you need to do to get to that win-win? Because usually when you're acquiring at a festival, um, I, you know, the distributor is trying to analyze how much that film's worth you know, us as filmmakers are trying to analyze how that film works, and our numbers never match. <laughs> they just don't, I think that's kind of, the, but someone always loses in that. So our process was like, let's find a way to get those numbers to match so that it's a risk averse process for the filmmaker and a risk averse process for the distributor when it's time to get that film out there into the world. Um, and so what they came back with in their research kind of boiled down to was, in order to reduce the risk on your film when you distribute a film, one of the biggest costs for any distributor is marketing. It's, it's really figuring out how to get that film out there into the world from a marketing standpoint. Well, the distributors would think, you know, I might acquire a movie for a million dollars, but then I dump just as much into marketing and now it has to do that much better or, mm -hmm. you know, so it's like, how can that be reduced? Mm -hmm. And so um, Harvard Business School said, you need to find a third party marketing partner to come on board early on, make a commitment to you, but that commitment is just, hey, when your film is done, we're gonna be there to support the marketing of your film. And as you guys know, it's a really edgy film. So we were like, how is that gonna happen without us sacrificing anything creatively? 
Um, and because we did all that research up there, we had this amazing relationship with the farmers, they were like, well, we grow these blue potatoes, which is kind of rare. Um, this company called Terra Chips has been, that's where we sell these potatoes to. They've been really great. They're kind of like um, super supportive to the farmer. They don't have to go through all these middlemen. They were sort of like doing indie yeah. farming. Like they weren't yeah. working with like Lay's or McCain or something. Yeah. It was like, we, we grow these blue potatoes and then we have this, we've made this great deal with Terra Chips and you know, so you should, you know, maybe talk with them and see what's, what, what they think, you know, and yeah. so we went yeah. to Terra Chips. We said, okay, yeah. let's, let's try it. And that process is, you know, um, we had never done that process before. And so we cold called Terra, found their marketing department and found uh, the right person who managed the Terra Blue Potato Chips. And we said, hey, we're working on this movie. We'd love to send you a script to look at. We're shooting all these harvest scenes yeah. on the LeJoie family farm, which, you know, they know that that's, they get almost yeah. all of their blue potatoes from this farm. And you weren't done shooting, or were you done shooting? Oh, this we was when we were just in, like in the oh, script okay. phase. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, it was just right when we finished the script, actually. And so we sent the script to them, um, and we hadn't heard anything back. And our entertainment attorney said, of course you're not going to hear anything back. He's like, there's crazy scenes in this movie, you know, it's a, Terra is owned by Hans Celestial, which is a Fortune 500 company, you know, there's really, the odds are so slim that anything will happen with this, and so we weren't expecting anything, but we never wanted to give up the chance of just throwing it out there. If they want to say no, say no, but we're at least going to try, um, and then a while later, like a long time later, like maybe a month and a half or something, we got a phone call from Jared Simon from Terra Chips, and he said, hey, sorry it took so long to get back to you. I had to run the script up the flagpole to see if I could get approval, but we're really interested in working with you guys. Um, we'd love to make a commitment for the marketing of this film. We really believe that our uh, consumers are very much indie film fans and would really appreciate us supporting a film like Beneath the Harvest Sky and not some big commercial studio film. Fortunately, the farmers aren't dealing drugs or smuggling yeah. drugs so that they could still sort of stand behind that storyline yeah. of these yeah. like honest farmers. And, and it could, they said their whole thing was we could tell the story behind the film, the story of right. the LeJoie family farmers and what When they the movie were doing. came out, they could use that as a platform to tell that like farm to table story that they do like this really is a farm up there and that's where we yeah. get our potatoes and mm -hmm. so yeah. suddenly our movie was going to be on bags of Terra potato chips oh. and yeah. their partners yeah. with JetBlue their official snack of JetBlue yeah. so then you know they're on the bags there and we shot yeah. videos to promote the movie that were on JetBlue all summer when the movie was released and mm -hmm. so it became this yeah. huge package that we yeah. had with our movie when we took it yeah. to Toronto for the, the world premiere. Yeah, so it's really hard for, I mean, I guess we, it's, it's not as simple as it sounds. It sounds great at the end because it, you know, it all ended up working out at the end. Yeah. But um, that commitment to us going into pre-production and going into production was like, okay, they're committing. But in the back of our mind, we're like, there's no way they're committing. And so even in pre-production, and then when we got into production, we're like, we're making the film that we want to make. It was, it was important to us that they weren't involved in the production or the production expenses. It was marketing. And yeah. if we make our movie and then they look at it and say, oh, yeah, this is... You know, it's one thing to read it on the page, but now they see it and they're like, yeah. oh, yeah, we, we don't want any part of this. We were fine. And you we know? also wanted to make sure that Tara was happy with, like, not being committed to a film that they weren't happy with. We didn't want them to feel pressure, like, okay, we committed to you guys, but we don't really want to put our brand on this. Like, we don't want that. We want everybody to be happy at the end of the day in terms of relationships. And so... Um, I mean, that's one thing that we talk a lot about is, like, just a win-win situation. Any relationship we enter into... What's in it for them? What's in it for us? Yeah. I think it's important. You know, a lot of times people will approach us and you think, like, there's really nothing in it for us. <laughs> like, yeah. you know, we're, you know, so yeah. what's in it for us? But anytime we approach someone, it's like mm -hmm. we at least try to tell them reasons that there's something in it for them. And, yeah. you know, it I think. It sounds really weird, but it's really important that, like, because you get inundated, like, you know, you might have, like, one opportunity at success at something, and then all of a sudden everybody's like, oh yeah, here, here's my thing and I want you to help me. And it's like, well, no, it's a collaborative effort and process. Like Tara Chips didn't call us back because 
they just really felt like they really wanted to support an indie filmmaker. They did as a part of the larger component, but they were like, we want to reach indie film fans. And so what's the best conduit to do that? Well, by connecting to a film that's in the indie world. And for us, it was like, well, perfect, because then you can help market a film, the Beneath the Harvest Sky, with all of your partners. And that deal ended up opening up to a larger deal by doing like an exclusive deal with Amazon Prime, because they really wanted a relationship with Tara. And Tribeca Films ended up acquiring the film. And Tribeca wanted, had a great relationship with Amazon Prime. And so all of a sudden, all these partners started coming to the table that um, would never have come to the table. Right. At or, the oh, you know, maybe iTunes wants to be on the end of the video that runs on JetBlue or something, and they'll give placement in exchange for that. Or, you know, so suddenly it would open it up to all these yeah. other things where we're just like, oh, you know, that one relationship turned into multiple yeah. relationships. But that one relationship ended up being so valuable because we actually just finished, you know, we worked with Tara for two and a half years on just developing, you know, we'd check in with them and say, hey, we want to give you an update on what's happening. They didn't have to check in with us. We were like, we want to share how production's going so you guys don't have to worry that there will be a movie out there someday. Um, you know, when we were deciding on festivals, we were like, is there any leverage that you have if we did, you know, Toronto over any other festival? And they were like, we'll throw your party at Toronto, you know? So they were like totally on board. But, you know, turns out people that work at Terra Chips are big Game of Thrones and Littlefinger fans too. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> that, that was actually how, like, we did a cut of the film, and when we finished the cut of the film, we were like, this is really edgy. And so, it, the first time we ended up going to their headquarters in New York was when we actually had a cut of the film. Other than that, it was all phone calls. Mm -hmm. So, when we actually drive up to their headquarters, you're like, wow, this is really businessy, like very, like, you know, very corporate. And we're like, uh, Aaron, based, it was dead of winter, and Aaron's like, keep your jacket on because we might have to be leaving very quickly after the screening. And the executives met us. They took us up to the fourth floor. We set up the film for them. And Aaron and I were on the first floor, and Aaron's like, do you know how many times we say the F word in this movie? <laughs> like, it was, it's a lot. It's like 170 times. And we were really worried, and, uh, then the executives came back down and got us, and all, they didn't say one word going up four flights of stairs. And she hates awkward silences. Hate awkward silences. So we sit down yeah. and she's like, um, so it is edgy, and they're like, first of all, we love the movie, and you said there were no A-list stars in there, but little fingers in there. Yeah. like, oh, right, yeah. We're like, yeah, little fingers in there. <laughs> so it, it worked out fine, and then like the, they were able to do a lot of stuff when we were acquired by Tribeca Films. The Tribeca Films decided to launch um, the film release tied to uh, our US premiere at Tribeca. And then since Terra Chips is headquartered there, they all had a chance to work together to really kind of give it a good push out of the gate. And what I hear is that you were, what fostered all that was your concern to make sure the relationship with Terra Chips was one that, you, that was so beneficial that they could right. help but go, I know, I have this connection to help, and this and it just became this bigger thing because you were so like, we're gonna make this, and we're gonna make sure that you guys are so on board and so just jiving with it and everything, and you were so concerned yeah. about the relationship, um, which. To so, let you know, yeah. like we ended up having lunch with the guys from Terra Chips that came out for a conference or something, and we ended up having lunch with them the other day. Yeah. So that relationship, even though the film's out, there's no more stuff happening with like Terra doesn't have to do any more stuff, but we have a great relationship with them still, and. Like the head of Hain Celestial was like, what's your next movie? Because we'd like to get involved uh, doing whatever. And we're like, we're not making a movie about beets. <laughs> like, we already did potatoes. <laughs> um, you've said so many great things for um, first time writers and directors out there. If you could, um, to kind of wrap it up, what would be one thing that you would kind of want to land them to go, okay, if you're going to make your first film, remember? Uh. <laughs> to, to me, it's always don't wait for everything to fall into place before you start because you'll just wait forever. Like just the action of actually starting and sort of getting the train moving forward, then you're forced to just jump on and keep riding and things work their way out and figure their way out. But if you wait until everything is all set in place and it's perfect, you'll never get there. So, you know, at some point along there, we just said, you know what, production's starting on this date, and once that was yeah. set, 
everything started moving and when that date came we were up there and we had our actors and we had everything and it's kind it, of a you surreal somehow experience. Find, find a way yeah it's a totally surreal experience to be like oh we're in production we said we're going to be in production and we're in production how did that happen <laughs> but i also think there's something to the idea of every filmmaker we know that really tried to start and get out there ended up doing the same thing that other filmmakers were doing and aaron and i kept saying to ourselves if they're all doing that, let's find a different way around that process. And I think that's helped us tenfold because if you're all going for the same investors, you're all going for the same festivals, you're never, it's hard to break out when you're a first time filmmaker. And so find another way around to get your movie made and think out of the box is definitely something we kind of do a lot. <laughs> I think that's a great place to end. Let's give them a hand and say thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>